moments in the text, they feel almost like those pure rushes of adrenaline you get when you make a discovery in your own play. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the lights go on again and again and again in a process like that because it's like you get to slip into Strindberg's shoes or, or uh, 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 Chekhov's shoes or, or uh, it, it, it can be a remarkable exercise to learn the craft of writing. And that particular play I was also going to direct, and there was no better preparation directorially than to adapt the play. And not speaking Swedish, I, uh, I did what a lot of writers in my situation do, and I commissioned a literal translation from a Swedish speaker that was sort of blunt with little or no poetry but pure, and I was able to then build on that. Uh, and that was a really useful exercise. And and finally, I guess the last, when I was thinking about my own relationship to adapting classics, what is a classic, I would sort of say, with my tongue only slightly in my cheek, that uh, in the realm of film, I've adapted two films into musicals, and arguably in their genre, you might call these movies classics, uh, The Maisel's Brothers' Grey Gardens, a classic documentary, and Disney's beloved animated The Little Mermaid, a classic animated film based on a, a classic story. And, and those processes were markedly similar and seem to address this topic because they're as scary as adapting the Bible in that people are so territorial and devoted to those two artifacts in the culture and, and, and if you get them wrong, you greet the wrath of a million fans. And you could say, arguably, that they're very different demographics. With The Little Mermaid, the target audience tends to be 8 to 14-year-old girls. And with Grey Gardens, it's probably gay men in their 50s. But I would suggest that those two constituencies have a shocking amount in common. <laughs> <laughs> and that... Uh, and that if you get it wrong, you hear about it. So anytime you're adapting what we could argue is a canonical work, you run the risk of inflaming its, its devoted and core audience. Have you ever confronted that, Connie? Have you ever adapted something that was revered or beloved and, and, and carried the weight of, oh my god, I might screw this up? I, I have done two, and they were both Russian. One of them is uh, a play by, <clears throat> I just spent last year working on this man's plays, and I can't remember his name, but maybe it will come to, Schwartz, his name is Schwartz. I'm not kidding, I'm not being Mel Brooks, that is actually <laughs> his name, Evgeny <laughs> Schwartz. And the play is A Wonderful Day for Miracles, or A Day for Miracles, um, and it's, this man is worshipped in, in Russia. So I did an adaptation. I called it Something About a Bear. It was done in Minneapolis. Lisa uh, Channer and her partner, uh, Volodya, uh, complicated Russian last name man, uh, have this theater called Teatro Novi Most. Most means bridge. So um, I said it in... Minneapolis. I actually sent it, set it in the upper part of the state, and we got people with Minneapolis accents, and uh, it really was a labor of love. It was a, a, a play with music, and at the very last moment, uh, a bear that is part of the story actually appears it's one of the most wonderful moments in any play I've written. Um, it was the bear they had used at the Guthrie for a production of A Winter's Tale. So this uh, puppeteer, puppeteer does not describe him. I mean, the Henson people actually do a lot of work in Minneapolis. He built this beautiful, perfect bear costume that he inhabited with sound and movement, he looked exactly like a bear. And at the very end of the play, there are all these uh, birch trees in the background. Um, you hear this sound, and soon this bear appears and walks along the up, up stage through the birches, 
comes up on his legs. It's actually a female bear. It's the mother of one of the characters. Um, and raises her har arms and then looks at everybody in the lodge and the audience and makes this wonderful bear sound and then chuffs and then exits. And it's just a, mu just a completely magical moment. I wept the first time I saw it. It's just amazing. But then we had the reception and this huge amount of, huge number of Russians came and they worship uh, Evgeny Schwartz the way we worship uh, like Tennessee Williams or somebody like that or August Wilson. And I thought, oh my God, I'm in for it. And they came up to me and they said, uh, we think it is better than the original. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you're Americans in Russian suits. This can't be true. But So I was very, very relieved. It doesn't always happen like that. Um, <clears throat> the other one I did that is, I'm just going to tell you the successful ones. <laughs> <laughs> Not the ones where a bunch of little eight-year-old girls come after me with, you know, uh, and this was, I worked on this play forever with uh, the very relentless Olympia Dukakis, and the title of the play is Vasa Zelizhnova. And it, uh, Gorky wrote two versions of it. The second version is after he got communism, and it's very preachy, and I like the original version. Again, I commissioned, as I did with the Evgeny Schwartz, uh, a Russian speaker, uh, some in other words, who is actually Russian, who speaks Russian as opposed to a literary person, to do what I would call the literal mm -hmm. translation. I worked on it again and again and again, and by the time it was up, we were going into rehearsal, I was in the dressing room by myself looking at a picture of uh, Gorky and saying, you know, Maxime or Ilya, I think I did a good job. And that if you can look at the playwright and they're not, <laughs> you know, uh, then, <clears throat> and you know what? I still love that play. It's turned out to be one of the, my favorite things that I wrote. It's so filled with, with me and what I believe a, a, after complete immersion in this world of, um, well, just briefly, everybody in the play is one generation out of, uh, up from being serfs. And the serf system in Russia has tremendous parallels to the slavery system in America. So I was able to write about both of those things. And so those turned out to be really good, mm -hmm. good experiences. Mm -hmm. I, I've had some others that weren't as much fun, but I just don't want to talk about those. So. <laughs> it's interesting, though. Uh, I want to ask you another question. And it's just uh, your description of that bear crossing the stage was so haunting and so beautiful and so particular. Now, you could be the wrong person to ask because I know you to be an astonishingly audacious and stylistically bold writer. Thank but you, but Doug. would you like I never would have in, of my own volition written a bear for a long stage cross late in a play of mine. But but do the adaptations that you work on make you braver in your own work or influence its course in some way? Um no. But you know what it does do is it takes a tremendous pressure off, out of trying to find the fucking plot or the forward <laughs> motion or the story or whatever that, you know, wakes you up at 2 a.m. and, you, you know, because it's, that's already, that's taken care of. So uh -huh. there's some deep relaxation. Uh, I, when I came up with the bear idea, Lisa Channer said, no, no, we can do that. And it'll be beautiful. I promise. It's not going to look like, uh, you know, a Sesame Street doggy or mm -hmm. something. That it won't be laugh. It won't, people won't laugh. It it'll be beautiful. And of course, and it was. Wow. I. I it's also um, the topic can be um, inspired by its 
historic or classic thing to write your own, not necessarily this adaptation. Well, yes. I was thinking, actually, as, as we were talking, I just had a play at the Atlantic Theater Company in New York, a, a play called Posterity, which was a play about Henrik Ibsen written in the style, if you will, of a, a classic sort of four-act Ibsen play. And that was glorious because he, as, as Connie was saying, when you liberate yourself from uh, – having to locate the narrative. And I think narrative falls in and out of fashion, not because we lose interest in it as writers or audiences, but because it's so hard to do and to do well. And I think even in, in, in avant-garde work that bravely kind of eschews narrative and doesn't tell a conventional story, as audiences, it's so in our bones, we're always experiencing it with well, what's going to happen next? Well, how does that element connect to this element? Well, what is the next stepping stone I need to get to the next moment and, and cognitively make sense of this dis dissonant piece? So I think narrative, I I and Ibsen was a master of it, and yet a lot of the techniques that he uses uh, to forward it on stage have grown woefully out of fashion, like uh, the servants gossiping about who's in the next room or who's coming up the walk and uh, conventions like that or letters that are exchanged and read aloud or corny deus ex machinas like diaries or a set of dueling pistols. And there was something exhilarating about getting to embrace all those hoary old devices and do it in an unapologetic way and claim it as homage. Uh, that, was, that was really, really satisfying. And, and so, and again, I, that was part of a continuum because first I'd adapted the Strindberg play and then I went on to write my own faux Ibsen play, and I think one was a kind of preparation for the other to kind of work in late 19th century Scandinavian drama, uh, but it proved really, really worthwhile, and it, it was definitely a master class in formalism, in how to set something up in Act One and have it pay off in Act Four and make sure that every actor from the uh, lackey in the stable to the, the lady of the house had a, a, a compelling and complete journey that took them somewhere that wasn't arbitrary. And uh, so it, it, it was uh, an exhilarating exercise. Uh, and uh, so I do find, I do find like, like Quills being based on the Grand Guignol, Posterity based on uh, an actual Ibsen text, Connie, Connie mentioned my play, I Am My Own Wife, which is based on a sort of uh, cinema verite documentary style of theater making, akin to what Emily Mann has pioneered in Execution of Justice and Moises Kaufman in the Laramie Project. So, so I am fascinated when I alight on a historical figure that interests me. Uh, the first step for me is usually finding the genre or the frame or the formal structure that seems to best exemplify that life in some way. So uh, form for me follows character to a certain degree, particularly when that's a historical character. Uh, I, I just want to in insert this at, at apropos of nothing, but I've always wanted to do a, a, a head of gabbler and have re replace the pistols with slingshots. <laughs> and then just see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've taught that play. I've worked on two productions of it. Uh, when I first started teaching at Amherst College, I decided I, I, I was teaching modern drama and I needed to give a lecture. So my lecture was on Ibsen and Hedda Gabler and I fell asleep in my own lecture. <laughs> So, uh, two things. Number one, never lectured again. Secondly, I tried to steer clear of Ibsen, except Per Gunt, <laughs> which I think is just brilliant. So, uh, that just was an embittered, mean comment, but I, I wanted to share it with you. Questions? Anyone? Yes, Lee.
Well, a, a production of a play is a translation, first of all. A play in English, and you go into production, that's a translation. Um, we can only try. And uh, so what I've done with my Moliere, that I've actually had quite a nice life with, uh, paid for my condo, it's been, Moliere's been very, very good to me. I uh, commissioned a trans, a literal translation from a Moliere scholar, in this case, Virginia Scott. And so what I got was a document that not only had the literal translation, but it had footnotes and notes about what other translations had done at, and succeeded or failed with. And then, I mean, I remember one of her notes was, I think this is a reference to something, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and so I would, I, I would use this document, and then I would create the misanthrope, and it was a recreation. And because of that, I feel very close to Moliere, because I feel like I was, you know, was definitely had to hear his voice to be able to do it. So I, I hear what you're saying, Lee, but without the French translation, uh, the translation from the French uh, of, for instance, Perubu, um, I would be in deep trouble because I, I don't read French and, and I, the Spanish I read is just pathetic. So, and the Russian, I, I really need the translations. I've, I've paid attention to what different translators bring and the only thing I can go back to, well, a production is a translation and as I'm sure you know, it, you go see one production of your play and then you go see another production and you go, well, that one was in English and this one was in Martian because the difference is just so, so tremendous. It's also partly, I think, uh, it becomes in a way an ethical question because, uh, you know, don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this illustratively. I don't mean to speak for Connie, but, but she wants to do an adaptation of Moliere. She doesn't want to do an adaptation of Richard Wilbur's adaptation of Moliere. So if you find that you're reading a lot of translators' versions of a particular text, the risk of borrowing from them or undue influence can be very high, and you want to make sure that you're not in violation of, of their copyright on a particular translation. So it's usually prudent to go back to the source and clear your mind as much as you can and work elementally from the original language. And one thing that's been extraordinarily helpful to me in this regard has actually been seeing my own plays in translation mm -hmm. because I think any good translation is also an act of cultural adaptation and fidelity to your text isn't always the most important criteria. And by that I mean uh, when I saw Grey Gardens the musical in Japan. Now Japanese as a language is structured very, very differently from our own. And the whole language is made up of short staccato syllables. But it can take many more syllables to say picnic in Japanese than it does the two it takes us in English. So picnic can be a nine syllable word. Now consider that a lot of the text of that show is lyric, and there are a finite number of notes and beats in the score. So one 12-syllable line in English could be 36 syllables in Japanese and destroy the song. So the translator had to come up with highly evocative lyrics that read almost like abstract poetry but met the meter of the music and plot and character content that were enfolded into the song the way classic American musical writing requires was actually excised and placed in book scenes so that it would still forward the story we were trying to tell and there was no limit in terms of the number of syllables that the translator could use. So was that a fidelitous translation of Grey Gardens? Emphatically not. Were the play's themes and its narrative arc and the journeys of its characters retained? Well, yes. Uh, th then you also face other issues too like 
in America, there's a whole cult of interest in, in Jackie Kennedy, and of course these were her relatives, and there were jokes about the Kennedys in the piece. And in Japan, uh, there just isn't that cult of interest in them. They know them in an in a incidental way, but they're not the subject of endless tabloid fodder or countless biographies or, or, or TV movies. And so jokes about the Kennedys required a very different treatment in Japan. So on the one hand, you could say, oh, they cut my great jokes, but on the other hand, they supplanted them with lines that made cultural sense in their own context. And in doing so, uh, it might have been a different laugh, but in the rhythm of the play, it landed with a laugh when it needed to. So, so uh, those are some of the issues that you face when your work is being translated, and then you bring that body of knowledge when you're translating something uh, anew. And and I tend to think, uh, well, like Connie was when she was talking about setting this uh, Russian play in Minneapolis, there are choices you make so that it will play to the audience you expect to see it. And in some sense, as long as you're uh, you know, genuflecting to the playwright at night and genuinely trying to serve them, you do them a greater favor by taking those liberties than if you were slavishly true to what's on the page. This was a really public argument that Richard Nelson had with Rolf Fjelde. So, uh, you know, Rolf Fjelde, who's no longer with us, uh, did a lot of translations of Ibsen. And Richard Nelson was doing, was one of the first of us to, to work with a transliteration and then do a version. And it was not only Ibsen, but many, many other playwrights. And they had this argument uh, that was about, these were the two issues. Ralph Fjelde says, I am fluent in this, in Norwegian. I'm, hello, Norwegian. Rolf Fjelde, uh, and uh, I've spent my lifetime working on these translations of Ibsen. Richard Nelson says, I'm a playwright. Uh, I've seen Ibsen in various translations, and I come to it uh, as a playwright. And those, that's where the line of demarcation was drawn. And then I, I, I actually have read both of these translations, and uh, I'm so tired of Ibsen. Here I am talking about <laughs> him again. Oh, my God. Uh, anyway, uh, the, ultimately, I think what Ibsen would have wanted uh, was for his plays to be alive for the audience. Now, my play, Tales of the Lost for Mikans, was translated into Finnish, so because they felt there was a lot of things about Formikans that w was reflected in, uh, in, you know, Finland, the, in Finnish society. Families all living together in small uh, little apartments or houses. Uh, the loss of control of the younger generation. Uh, medical issues. The huge changes in society. So I appreciated that very much. It was done in Finland in, um, at the Lila Teatern, which is in Helsinki, which is actually the Swedish theater. But it was done in English. Uh, but then I started getting notes from the translator. Try, and I realized Formikens is filled with cultural references, just filled with them. So trying to explain things like what kind of truck is that Peter built, dickhead, you know, which is not a joke I'm proud of, however it is that moment, and finding that there was the, it, it was untranslatable. And there was just so, there were so many, mall, they got the mall, they understood the mall. Malls were actually invented first in Helsinki and secondly in Minneapolis. And that's because, well, there are some similarities have to do with weather. So you would enter in Minneapolis into Stockmans, and you could basically go to all the stores by going through tunnels and hallways. So that was, uh, oh, I'm rambling. Anyway, I do think it may be a failed, not a failed, but let's say a not ideal uh, situation, but... Um, you know, I'm an American, I'm unilingual, so whatever I know about uh, 
drama from other languages, and I would even include Elizabethan English in that I know from study and from adaptations and translations. Yes. Thank you, honey. Which is a work of genius, by the way. Don't you agree? Isn't that beautiful just play? Just beautiful play. Well, without that, we probably wouldn't have any theater because all theater has been adaptation. If you think if you start back, if you don't you don't go to the Sanskrit plays, but move a little forward into the more modern plays of the Greeks. So those are all you know adaptations of uh, stories that everybody heard, and then the versions of that continue to be done. And with that, I'm handing it off to my colleague Doug. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a, a a great question, and I guess I'd uh, were I one of the writers who felt compelled to do it, perhaps I could offer you a better answer. I've never been emboldened enough to take a a, a fellow writer's character and and hypothesize on their behalf, and some writers have to absolutely dizzying and and great effect. I'm not one of them. Uh, but I think maybe one reason writers do, and I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with my esteemed colleague here only in as much as I'm afraid having just written a play about him, I'm something of an Ibsen fan. Oops. And <laughs> but uh, to me, Hedda, for example, is, is a compelling character because uh, – uh, uh, she is so inscrutable, and and with uh, it, 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 like like uh, Connie is saying, in any performance even is an act of translation, and so many brilliant actresses have have plumbed that role and transformed it each time they do it. So she remains, I think, a continual figure of fascination for us. Uh, I'm not sure I'd ever take her on. Uh, uh, so. I, I feel like I'm not giving you a satisfying answer, but maybe it's because I let sleeping dogs lie. Yeah. Oh, do that, Kevin. So this is Drew Lichtenberg. Um, he is the uh, dramaturg at the Shakespeare Theater working for Michael Kahn. He's about to finish his DFA at Yale. And, um, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. I'm, I wasn't expecting to speak. Um, yeah, we uh, at Shakespeare Theater, and this is the question I was actually going to ask you guys, so maybe I can turn it into a question. Uh, Michael Kahn, our artistic director, passionately believes in what we call our rediscovery series, which is commissioning new translations and adaptations of plays that, for whatever reason, have been lost to history. So three years ago, we were the first theater to commission uh, an adaptation of Schiller's Wallenstein, a nine-act play from the Weimar classicism era by the former poet laureate Robert Pinsky. Uh, this forthcoming season, we've commissioned Yael Farber, uh, an, an adapter, director, divisor from South Africa, to do a new version of Salome, departing from Oscar Wilde, uh, because she feels like Oscar Wilde is yet another man giving a name to this nameless woman uh, from biblical history. Uh, we've also commissioned three rhymed verse French comedies from David Ives. Um, I call it the David Ives Trilogy, and we're currently searching for a fourth comedy or maybe a different uh, 
a Russian comedy maybe for him or something inverse for him. So my qu and we actually asked Doug. I don't I don't think this is public information, but we have the money for uh, a, a one night version of the Oristia by Aeschylus, which is our next big passion project. And we asked Doug, and he passed. <laughs> um. a, a, a one night? Get, what? Well, it's going to be it's going to have a full run, but we want to take it and condense it into one night. Oh, uh, into one night. So instead of three successive nights, because it's a it's a fairly long play. Uh, there might be some other writers available. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Just saying. Well, I, yeah, I know Michael had meetings with writers the week before I came out here, and I was hoping that they went really badly so that I could, <laughs> I could uh, recommend some more. Um, so my question for you guys was going to be, what is your white whale? What is the play that you feel is lost to history um, or the writer who you feel is for whatever reasons of the cultural divide, uh, the abyss of history has swallowed them and needs to be rediscovered. I also want to say that I'm, I'm an Ibsen partisan myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's, a really, there's a really great essay called uh, The Mask Behind the Face on Hedda Gabler by Eleanor Fuchs, which okay. is on... Uh, I like her. Yeah, she's amazing. And... It's on the relationship between that play and Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy and the sort of submerged romantic uh, uh, mythologies lying in the text. So I've always been fascinated by, by Ibsen the Romantic, and, and I love the Fialde translations. So I'm just putting that out there. I do know my white whale. Uh, and it's uh, I actually don't know the play, but it's a novel and it was adapted into a play that was one of the most oft-performed plays at the turn of the century worldwide. And I think the adaptation is now lost to us. But there's a wonderful novelist named Anne Radcliffe. Do you know Anne Radcliffe's fiction? Uh, she was uh, more or less the uh, creator of what we think of as gothic fiction. And we wouldn't have uh, Mary Shelley. We wouldn't have uh, Matthew Lewis's The Monk. We wouldn't have Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, we wouldn't have the Bronte sisters had it not been for Anne Radcliffe. And Anne Radcliffe wrote an absolutely stunning novel. I think it's my favorite novel. It's called The Italian. And it's about a uh, monk who's uh, called to confess. And the first scene of the novel, he enters the confessional and spills his crimes. And the attending priest is so overwhelmed, he dies of a heart attack and <laughs> falls out of the confessional. And so the mystery is launched. What did our hero do exactly? And uh, the story takes us on this wild journey through convents and finally even a face-to-face -face meeting with the devil himself. And it's uh, a giddy, over-the-top, fantastic novel that was adapted into a 19th century melodrama that played the world round. And it's, it actually becomes a sophisticated story about redemption and, and uh, the perils of uh, our man-made theology. But it's a, it's a brilliant, searing book. And I've long thought that it, it uh, cried out for some kind of theatrical form. Yeah, Josh. I felt that 
Well, I, I think playwrights have been doing the same thing for like, you know, 300 years, and that's that we, we see something in the world that moves or shocks or confounds us, and we feel something deeply. So then in our clumsy way, we try and commit it to the page, and we hold it up in front of 500 people sitting in the dark, and we say, have you felt this? Does this ring any bells? Does this bother you? Does this upset you? Does this move you? And if they laugh or applaud, we go, oh, thank God I'm human too. It's not just me. And I think that's kind of essentially this, uh, the, the simple nature of our craft. It's just uh, uh, siding with, with as much specificity as we can the very particular nature of one aspect of human experience and hoping to find in that universal truth. And if the classics are classics and have persisted to this day, it's because the writer did that with sufficient urgency and I think when we treat the classics or revisit them, we can pay far too much attention to form or language or decorum or a polite way of reproducing them in fidelitous museum fashion. And that's what can kill them in our lifetime or disengage us. But if we can see that sort of writer standing there holding their beating heart up for scrutiny and say that's why this play is still with us and put the production focus or the adaptation focus or the acting focus on that aspect of the text, the plays will make their own case for survival. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. And that looks like that's time, but I just want to say thank you for the plug, Josh. And you know, <laughs> Spring's Awakening, there's an example of something that is a canon play, and then it was done into a musical, and it really, really worked. But anyway, we're all available to answer your questions. We also did Connie's uh, Servant of Two Masters. Oh, yeah, we did that. Yeah. Um, that was. And that it, was was it was actually wonderful to do a show in completely old school, straight Commedia style and watch it work like a new play. Yeah, and that was uh, Jun Loon uh, from Minneapolis, Stephen Epp, and Chris Bays, and this fantastic cast from Yale. Uh, that was pure joy, yeah. pure joy. Okay, thank you, everybody. <laughs>